We out here? Rock and rolling. We got RJ Lamont back here again, man. Uh, how you doing today, bro? What's the deal? You know, just chilling. Uh, no vibes. It's, it's been, <laughs> it's been probably like not even two months, probably since the last interview. It's been a minute. I should have been back. Yeah, but it hasn't been that long, for real, bro. I think part of the reason um, everything came together again so fast is because people have so many questions, bro. So many questions me and you posted stuff that's literally going viral on the internet we've had talks here and um a lot of people had a lot to comment about a lot of stuff you said and i'm always on your i'm always on your side but i'm always gonna have your back with everything but um the statement we had talked about where you said you started the detroit scene and my perspective i mean i don't know how you take it but i feel like you weren't i feel like you were saying you are part of it and to not forget that more so as if you are literally singularly the person that did it. But how do you really look at it? Oh, shit. I knew that was coming quick, wasn't it? Yeah. But no, 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 no. We have to because, you know, people are tapping in for it. Yeah, it's crazy. But um, not to say it like that, but I guess, like, I did. But <laughs> <laughs> not not even like that. <laughs> but I, didn't say, but look, I didn't say I was the only person. Mm. But, yeah, someone showed me something. And I did what they showed me a little bit better than they did it. But I did yeah, but I'm not saying I'm the only person. It can't be one goat. It's it could be a lot of goats. It's a lot of goats around here. But I know I was there in the beginning. Like I remember a lot of people that was coming and was saying like, a lot of them, like a lot of people. Man, nah, I ain't gonna say it like that. They twist. My words wasn't even twisted. I did, but yeah. I mean, I I hear like the OGs and stuff, but. The, yeah, they OGs. And, no, 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 no. I don't even know what to say. Because I don't even you, know what to say. I just know I did. So, you, so to you, to you, it's just so much of a truth that it's like I'm not gonna try to make you guys feel better about what I said yeah. because it's the truth. So your statement is basically you started the Detroit scene, and obviously you're talking about a relative year. You're talking about a, a generation, not. I mean, obviously Eminem and everything like that, like helped the, had its wave, and then you know Doughboys Cash Out and East Side, uh, you know Team Eastside had their wave, which you were a part of. So you're talking about that particular wave till now. Well, before before I started doing music, rap was a side job. Mm -hmm. After I started doing music, rap became a full time job. Mm -hmm. So I did. <laughs> 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 uh, and now Tone Tones, you're like your cousin or whatever, right? Yeah, he and did show me a lot of stuff. Yeah, but t why did Tone Tone respond to you by saying, "I gotta see what's going on with my nephew right now"? Like he, he's like, "I have to." That's my cousin. Like, yeah, but it was like, if you my if you my cousin, you should just support whatever I'm doing. Like, I'm gonna support whatever my cousin doing. Mm. But no, let's be real. Okay, boom. My cousin was the first person signed in Michigan. He did what he did for himself. I watched what he did, and I showed a lot of other people how to do it. So, yeah. So I mean, when he's like, when he's not having your back with it, how does it make you feel? Like, are you sitting there like, damn, bro, I can't believe you don't have my back right now? Or how are you sitting there sitting with it? I called his mama. <laughs> I called his mama. I what? called his mama. What did you say to his mom? <laughs> I said, bro, what's wrong with, what's wrong with, what's wrong with uh, my big cousin? Like, yeah. Yeah, we got to see each other Thanksgiving and Christmas. I didn't even go to Thanksgiving or Christmas. I was so mad at him. Not because of that. I did, and I swear I was like, bro, I'm not going. Not because of the podcast talk. Oh, no, he was chirping. He was chirping. So that statement actually bothered you that he didn't come into your defense about starting the Detroit music scene? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it did bother me. I was mad. That was my cousin. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, you know, obviously... I, my my favorite thing is that you're sta you're sticking to it. Like you're not saying you're not c trying to change up what you said. You really feel like you were the beginning impact of Detroit's music scene and where it's at right now. Yeah, I didn't say I was the only person though. But yeah, I know what I did. I was yeah. there. I seen it. <laughs> yeah, because you were looking around. You're paying attention to the scene. You're realizing you're the only one doing what you're doing, which is going outside of Detroit to show the showcase the music that you were kind of shamed for playing in Detroit. You're in Detroit. You're trying to play Detroit music, the underground Detroit music. You're trying to play these guys, and other DJs are saying, "No, that's not the move. You're playing the wrong shit." So you decide, "I'm gonna go outside of the city and start spreading Detroit music across the state." And as much across the country as you possibly could, right? Well, to a extent. Well, to be... Um, yeah, that's like the political correct. But no, the real was, I still have to make some money. So I started DJing at college. I started. I just started driving around to other cities. And like when I would walk into clubs and try to get a job, I'd be like, yeah, I got all the Detroit music. I could bring the Detroit artists. 
it started just spreading, and not not people get booked in all the other cities. Yeah, I mean, shit, man. <laughs> I mean, if that's what happened, that's what fucking happened at the end of the day, bro. Like, if you were literally pioneering the the not pioneering, but like really facilitating the music throughout the state. Then I mean, who else was doing it? Is what you gotta ask. Like, who else was doing what you were doing at the same exact fucking time? I mean, name one DJ in Michigan that ever broke an artist. Like, made an artist. Like, broke them. Like, you know, the job. Your job as a DJ is to break an artist. Mm. Name one DJ that broke an artist, and name what artist was the artist that they broke. Mm. Drop that in the comments and let's see. <laughs> <laughs> but outside of that, it's like, man, not even think about it. Like, okay, only people really comment on what I said is like artists. But I didn't say I did it for the artists. Like, I did from the DJ producer pr- perspective, I did do it. Yeah, <laughs> I was there. But I didn't say I was the only person. Like, I know a lot of other people was there too. I know Hell of was there, and Beats was there, John Boy was there. We was all there. Yeah. We was all just trying to do it, and yeah, we was there. You People know what's so cool to me? Mm. So recently I went to a middle school and I seen a sixth grade class and it was, you I think that's like what, 11, 12, mm. 10 years. They knew who I was. I was mm. like, bro, how does some, how do some <laughs> 10 year old kids like know who I am? It's like, oh shit. Yeah, man. No, it's, it's common sense, bro. I feel like, do you feel like producers right now are still at the level of recognition that they were like two years ago or three years ago, kind of like when Blocks Party hit and you were hearing producers' names more prominently. Like everybody was trying to emphasize, like Hell of a made this beat, making skits about it, and really showcasing the names and stuff. And obviously, RJ's always tripping and really uh, putting the producers out there. Do you feel like the names are still as prominent as they once were, or do you feel like producers are kind of being overshadowed at, th- at this moment? But that's the game. That's what I'm saying. Everybody trying to like hold the producer down, not like. Let the producer shine, but like mm. you, we know how the industry work, bro. Like it's the industry, but yes, bro. Producers need to make a name for themselves. DJs need to make a name for themselves. Don't let the don't. I'm not gonna say that. Don't 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 let people overshadow you. Yeah, no matter what part of the game you're playing, because right? you're gonna get left behind. Mm-hmm. Like if you tie yourself to an artist and that artist is not hot no more, well, you ain't gonna be hot no more. I had a situation where I went to jail one time, when, like in the like in the peak of my career, and when I went to jail, bro, I had a bond that was like a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, my at that moment, all these no, I had no one to call, like no one to call to like help me pay the pay the bond and shit. But I was helping everybody like blow up. So I get it; it was my fault, and it ain't nobody's responsibility. But at that point, I realized like I need to focus on RJ. Like RJ, it need to be about RJ just about rj like just what i'm doing like mm-hmm. and that's how i kind of started like like branding myself like not so associated with the artist but like it's just me but at the same time it's like when people meet me they know like bro i could fucking just blow you up like i could blow you up like literally if i if you meet me you could just i could just be talking to you you hear something that just spark or we could be in a studio working and you make a you make a crazy song i didn't even have to do the beat I can make a beat for you, like, cause I know what, like, with the I created Detroit, like, I know, like, bro. I mean, I don't know. I just know how to make hits. Like, I know how to create a hit song. Like, I did it for so long. Yeah. So, what, have you, what have you been up to as of late, man? What you been on tour? I mean, you got Skilla Baby, uh, you know, jumping up on the crowds with you, man. Talk about that experience working with Skilla right now. Oh man, the, me and the Skilla Baby show is so funny because it's basically Skilla on stage yelling at me, telling me to stop tripping. <laughs> And me fucking up the show set. The whole show. Every time. Not even on purpose. It's like, for some reason, he'd be like, RJ, don't fuck up today. Don't be tripping. Mm. I walk on stage. I fuck up instantly. Play the wrong song or some shit. He just, RJ, what you doing? But, man, this happens so much. I'm starting to believe that, that that's the show. Like, it, it, the crowd be lit as hell, though. Like, the crowd, everybody in the crowd screaming, RJ always tripping. Mm. RJ be tripping. Play that shit right. <laughs> but... You think it makes the show better somehow? For some reason, bro. The, when I, when I go back and look at it, it do. <laughs> it do. Like it made the show like crazy. It's like just more spontaneous versus yeah. linear. Like it's just not pre-planned anymore. Yeah, but what? what only thing is like the crowd don't know what's going on. They think they think that's the show. Ah. But um, no. I mean, Skiller, we hit four cities. We hit Detroit, Chicago, Oakland, and L.A. Uh, the, my favorite show was the Oakland show. The Oakland show was amazing. The LA show was lit too, though. The LA show was lit. Yeah. And yeah, so we did the Skiller Baby tour. 
I'm about to go on tour with Baby Tron. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I go on tour with Baby Tron, I'm DJing for the boy too. So I'm, I'm about to start DJing for the boy. And um, what else I got going on? Um, after the Baby Tron tour with the boy, we throwing another RJ tour. So um, for the next RJ tour, I know I'm going to hit Detroit, Grand Rapids, um, Chicago, Columbus, Indianapolis. So we're going to do a five city tour. I haven't picked which artist we're going to do with the tour, but yeah, it's shit's still moving. Shit's still moving. The shit, the shit don't stop. Shit do not stop. No matter what nobody think of me, bro, it ain't going to stop. No, yeah, man. You're, I don't think I've ever seen you have to take a break. Um, but 2023, I'm signing. I'm doing my own label. I'm not working. This will be my last year, like, working for people. 2023, I'm owning my own label. When I own my own label, I'm doing all the touring. I'm doing all the merch. I'm doing all the artist promotion. And I'm going to be the first artist that I break off my own label. And the second artist I'm breaking is Rico Trap. Rico Trap, uh, the TikTok guy. Man, Bitch, why you show your pussy? Not the asshole. I, I keep hearing that. I didn't know that was... <laughs> yeah, so Rico Trap is going to be the first artist that I sign besides myself. And we owning a label this year. We buying our way out the Matrix. We owning the label. What do you think that's going to do for you to have your own, your own label? Well, I just feel like without owning your own stuff, you kind of just a worker. So to a extent, I mean, I get it. We make a lot of money, but it's a lot more money being made. And also, I feel like with what I got is very special. So, yeah, I shouldn't be selling these beats. I should be. Ownership is just, I just know that ownership is more important than making money. A lot of people get fascinated with making money, but that's the thing. That's the thing. These people give you this money because they want to take all your ownership. So this year, I'm owning everything. Very smart. We had an artist come on here talking about how he was offered a deal with the NBA 2K to have song placement. And he had called the producer that had made the beat for the song and said, we have rights to 2K. 2K wants our song. Give me the rights. And the producer wouldn't give up the rights. He's like, I don't even care about 2K. And I was wondering why he did that. Like, why didn't he give up the rights for the song? Is oh, he just any- wanted money. He just didn't pay him. He just got, you got to pay, you got to pay that type of stuff off. But he was probably trying to talk to him and like, we got an opportunity. So mm. let's just do this and make, but he was, the producer probably already had placements and stuff. And was like, nah, I want, I want that bad. Cause I know, I know how people play around with you. Yeah. People to play around with you and that, yeah, you can't let people play with you. When, but do, that, you, when do you think it's best to like lease a song versus sell the rights to the song? Or that's what like I'm even, saying. I'm about to own the label. So everything that even come through me, it's like, we, we own all of it. Okay. Because the ultimate goal is to be going directly from consumer to you. You don't want no middleman. You don't want no label. You don't want no distribution company. You don't want no... You want them You want them companies like BMI, Spotify to come to you and say, hey, we, we want a part of what you got. Like, nah. You, like, I know people will look at it like you're taking a smaller cut because, like, you're making less money, but you've been making 100% of all your money. And then that's going to go on to your kids going to make all that money, and then their kids going to make all that money. And it's just never going to stop. But that's more important because, yeah, they, they buy your shit. They buy your shit out. They what's, buy all your music out. What separates you? What's going to be the separating factor of the label that you're going to start versus the labels that are already out here? Are you doing anything different or are you just starting your own and kind of matching up with what everybody else is kind of offering? Well, people pay me to blow artists up. So mm-hmm. maybe I should just blow my own artists up. Mm-hmm. Basically. Right. And then, like, I, I threw my recent showcase. And when I threw my recent showcase, I had over a thousand artists hit me up. It's like, <clears throat> man. Do you think you're going to be able you. to do something different, though? Do you feel like, well, you can blow it out. So that's the difference, right? Sometimes an, a, a label owner won't have any creative ability and won't have any technical ability or skills, but you can offer that as well for your artists, like P. Diddy type shit or Master P type shit, where like, not only can I make fire shit for you, but I'm also going to help you control control your career. Well, people pay me to do it now, so why shouldn't I just do it for myself? Mm, fire. Damn. Yeah. How, do you feel like you wish you came up with this like 10 years ago? No, 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 no. Because at the same time, like I deal with some of the top artists. So even with what I got going on, the artists that I deal with are so big now. It's like it's easier for me to get it get it flowing. But hmm. yeah, yeah. 2023, I got to own everything. For sure. Talk about some cool experiences you've had since the last time you've been on here, man. What's been notable for you? Um, you started the touring thing, right? You talked last time about how you're going to be doing your own, booking your own shows and booking your own tours, right? Yeah. So I was already here after the Cash Kids tour, wasn't I? You were just about to go on Cash Kids tour, I think. Cash Kids tour was lit. Yeah. Uh, was anything notable on the Cash Kids tour? No. Mm. Oh, 
I DJed at the Chicago Theater. So when I walked in the Chicago Theater, I really didn't know what it was. But when they gave me the background, it's like the first theater in the world or something like that. The fuck? Like Frank Sinatra used to perform there and stuff. That's and it was basically telling me like it's legendary. So like I DJed there and that was lit. I, uh, I've been hanging out with Lyrical Lemonade a lot. Um, Cole Bennett? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, try, I'm about to go back on tour. When you've been, when it, I was just talking to um, somebody else about uh, Cole Bennett, man, it, the, the relationship and its building. Are you gaining anything from it from a creative aspect or learning anything about the scene more so being in a company with him? Or is it just a good relationship? No, nah, he throws showcases. Oh, okay, so you're learning a lot. He taught me the game. Okay. He throws showcases. It's just that his showcases are so big that now they feature people like Little Uzi. <laughs> but yeah, they do, they do showcases. Yeah. So like they taught me like the uh, the the way it works and how they did it and yeah they taught me some game they taught me some game cool uh, uh what else have I been doing what was the baby t- Tron tour like no he hasn't he he don't go back on tour till uh, January seventeenth we go on a tour for like two months start in Toronto end in Grand Rapids we go around the whole country okay cool um so since then the most notable thing for you has been working uh. Working these tours. I've been working with Skiller Baby. I've been working mm-hmm. with Skiller Baby a lot. We've been doing like high schools. Mm-hmm. We've been doing colleges. We've been doing a lot of stuff. We this this last four city tour though was crazy. That that was lit. That that was turned. Yeah, walk us through it. Um, the first show was in Detroit. The Detroit show was straight. It was sold out, but it's Detroit, so that's how it's supposed to be. Um, the next show was in Chicago. It was it it. It, yeah, it was the same day as Juice World Day, so we got to go to Juice World Day afterwards. Then we had Oakland. Oakland was turned. So at the Oakland show, I um after the show, so I had a great show. So at the Oakland show, the first show, I had the best show ever. Didn't mess up. Everything <laughs> went perfect. <laughs> Didn't mess up. <laughs> it, everything went perfect. The funniest thing about when I DJ for Skilla Baby is like, so when I play, so he'd be expecting me to sit over there and DJ, but I got like my own little personality. So every time I DJ for Skilla Baby. When he turns around, he sees me standing next to him, just grabbing him, just dancing with him and shit. He'd be like, get back in the DJ booth, RJ. What the fuck is you doing? So after that, the show went great, though. So the show went great in Oakland. And then we had an after party at the same spot. So it was like a two-hour gap. So I decided not to be RJ always tripping because I need to be on time. I need to be professional. So I didn't go to no parties. I didn't, I didn't do nothing lit. I didn't do nothing turn. I just... Stayed in my room to the, to the after party. Falls asleep. So I fall asleep and wake up, at, like, while he's on stage. So he's on stage, and he's calling me, like, RJ, where you at? We need you. So I wake up, call an Uber. My Uber didn't, put, didn't come quick enough. Bro, I walk out the hotel and just run. I run to the venue. Nigga, jury buffs <laughs> everything. Just ran to the venue. So I'm jogging to the venue. Walk in. All I hear is, uh, RJ, why are you tripping? <laughs> I jump in the DJ booth, drop the song, a classic night. Oh, my goodness. How far was the run, do you think? Like three blocks. Okay. It's still, yeah. it, was it cold outside? Uh, it was Oakland, so it wasn't that cold. But it okay. was just, I haven't ran in, like, years. That's fucking... <laughs> <laughs> I, took a, I took a light jog. Yeah. So you're hopping. Now, is Skilla, when you're working with Skilla, um... Is he, if, is he, are you guys, like, frustrated at each other when that stuff happens? Or is it, like, comical to you guys? It's comical to me. Yeah. yeah. Skilla, does Skilla get upset? Like, um, I'm, like, actually upset. Like, where is he, God, is he just like, God damn it, man. Like, or is he kind of like, all right, this is just what it is. This is fuck oh, it. no, he'd be mad as hell. Oh, he actually gets he'd mad? He'd be mad. He'd be mad, mad. Yeah. You ever seen Skilla get mad? Mm-mm. Oh, yeah, Skilla could get mad. He can get mad. <laughs> but, I don't know, RJ always tripping, so. Yeah. You, you can't even be mad at me. I'm always tripping. Facts. Facts. That's part of the show, man. It's fucking yeah. part of the, so the then, whole show. But then we had LA after that, so LA was turned. When oh, we get yeah. LA, yeah, that was turned. I had a, I, did, I did perfect at that show too. I ain't mess up. I ain't mess up the last two shows. The last two shows I did good. And, um Yeah, at the LA show I um had a twerk contest. Where? Yeah, the twerk contests are always great. Spring everybody on stage, drop juvenile. <laughs> it's going down. <laughs> <laughs> And what was uh? How do you win one of those things? What do you got to do? You just the best twerker? Is it the the booty matter? Like how do you freaking win? I think it's the most energy. Okay. Whoever make everybody like oh, <laughs> like if you hit the splits with no draws on, you winning. Damn, you no winning. draws. <laughs> you winning. <laughs> um, you got to meet uh, Miss America. 
I did meet Miss America. I, after the L.A. show, we went to Greystones. Mm. Greystones. I heard that in like a Drake song or something. Mm. I don't know. J. Cole, what do you say? All the girls be a great song because they know it's they song. <laughs> yes. So we went to Greystones. And um Yeah, we um we was chilling in Greystones. And I see some girls coming by and they're like, Hey, it's my friend's birthday. Can we get a shot? And I'm like, Who are you? Mm. She was Miss USA. <laughs> I'm like, Are you really? You're lying. <laughs> she showed me. She said, I'm Miss USA. I said, Oh damn. <laughs> Only in LA. The same night I met designers producer, the dude who made Panda. After I met him, he took me to this party and I met Trippy Red. Cool. And then was that this year? Or are you talking about something? Previous? No, this is the same night. Oh, okay. <laughs> I went to a party. Like I, I, I met her. She was like, "Hey, this is my friend. It was the dude who made Panda." So I met him. He took me to another party and it was with Trippy Red. And I got to work with Trippy Red that night. Oh, cool, man. Uh, talk about when you meet a producer, like the producer to pr- pr- producer conversation. Is it is it separate from like if you speak to a rapper or somebody else because you guys are working in the same field and understand each other? Or is it just like a person to person thing and you don't even think about music? Um, to a extent, because you got to think I'm a DJ and a producer, so yeah. But from the producer aspect, it's just um just cool vibes. If you're a cool person, people always gonna want to hang out with cool people, especially in LA. Like, yeah, if you're cool, people are kind of. Yeah. You just gotta know how to vibe it out, and you you and me some people like going to LA. You can go to L- oh, I, I met the dude that owns LA. It's like I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> he owns part of no, he he own like the whole film industry in LA. Oh, but sure. yeah, just messing around in, like in LA is just really a place you can go and like overnight your life can get changed. So when you yeah. t- you're just talking, you're having a good time. Then you he uh, how do you get introduced to Trippy Red? Because I had bitches. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I'm saying like, you know, who introduced? So okay, he boy, he didn't walk up to me like, hey, there's some badass bitches you got around here. Nah, they was kind of like he could come because he got all them, he got all them bad girls with him. Oh, you know, kidding? <laughs> yeah, to a extent, yeah. Um, so yeah. then, so how did you guys get in the studio and end up making a song together? Um, <laughs> I had bitches. <laughs> I know that. I had part. bitches and beats. I was like, bro, I got some beats too. He was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. boom, 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 boom. boom. <laughs> 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 it worked out. We made three songs that night. Okay, cool. Uh, those haven't released yet, obviously. This was like two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> the story gets better and better, man. <laughs> what, uh, what's it working like? What's it like working with Trippy Red, bro? Um, they kind of lit though. No, 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 I ain't gonna lie. They, I mean, I get it. People will look at them like they different and stuff, but that music sells. So yeah, if I get a chance to like work with like some higher ups, I'm about to do it. Yeah, man. Uh. Yeah, that's pretty cool, bro. You're working with, I mean, you worked with just fucking big dogs. You're a big dog, obviously, but working with big dogs, it's just, like, always interesting from a perspective of me of being a fan of music and just being a fan of hip-hop. And just, like, hearing, like, legends work together is kind of crazy because it's, like, it's just, like, it works, right? Like, you just know that that person is working as hard as you and wants it as much as you, but you're also both creatives and appreciate each other's sounds and stuff like that. But you're working together just off chilling. Like, it's not even, like, a. it wasn't, like, a planned thing, like, you're just chilling, and you end up making music together. You know what I'm saying? When I graduated college, when I ain't gonna say when I graduated, when I, my first day of college, my teacher said, "This is the Pro Tools book. You just paid me thirty thousand for me to read this Pro Tools book for you. Man. Now listen, if you really want to make it in the in the music industry, that's all you gotta do. Are you gonna steal from me? Are you gonna talk too much? And are you gonna be a cool ass nigga to hang out with? <laughs> if you could do those three things, you're gonna be successful. Well. As long as you keep moving the craft forward, right? You have to work. Like you got to put the work in. You know. Yeah, I mean, but I'm already, I'm already sweet. So I mean, every like, I ain't gonna just say like I'm sweet, but like everybody that like does it, everybody is talented. Everybody is unique. What's in their head is like we're all talented. So well, you even said that you didn't even have time to learn how to make beats. You were just doing it. Well, I had to realize whatever that was was special. So just keep doing that because yeah. everyone else trying to recreate it. While I'm trying to listen to what they're doing, they trying to recreate that, and it's like. I didn't even have time to figure out what that was. Do you know what me and my daughter do? What? Whenever, uh, like, I get in the car or something, she'll be like, bah! I'm <laughs> like, did somebody let a goat in here? <laughs> <laughs> Talk about Christmas, man. What did you guys end up doing for Christmas? She got three Barbie dream houses. Why? Because she wanted three. Three? <laughs> she got three Barbie dream houses and an iPhone and a paint set because she liked the paint. Yeah, uh, so basically she built a neighborhood. 
Yeah, yeah. If you see my living room right now, just know that it's a five year old that lived there. But yeah, Christmas Actually, yeah, is I did tight. think. Uh, yeah, you showed me that, right? Mm-hmm. Before, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, you, you were like, yeah, and this is her room. Uh, but it wasn't even her room. It was like her playroom. I was like, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. she don't use her room because I, yeah. yeah, she don't get out. I, but then like I, I figured that like at first I, like I wanted her to sleep in her own room. But then like I'd be meeting girls that be like. 22 and they'd be like I still sleep in the bed with my dad I'd be like oh so she's never gonna get out of my bed it's just that's what kids do I guess okay you meet 23 year old girls that sleep in the bed with their dad yeah what I said the same thing. he said the same thing what that's a big ass red flag the, your dad is your safety person like your dad is your person your dad is your person like at the end of the day when everybody else fails you your dad is gonna be that man for you no kizzy trying so it's like yeah, like I like I remember um, we went to uh, Kalahari for her birthday, and she was it's crazy because she's five. She said, "Daddy, I need to talk to you." I said, "What?" She said, "I just don't feel like you understand me right now, a five year old." I'm like, "What are you talking about?" She like, "You try to make me feel like I'm too grown. I know I'm not a baby no more, but I'm your baby, so I still want you to treat me like a baby type thing." And it's like, "Oh yeah, like I get it. Like, yeah, that's my baby. Like that's my baby. Like yeah." You know, they say that a lot of women like when they have certain relationships with their fathers they'll look for that in their boyfriend or like their future husband and stuff like that like they look for those same qualities that they found in their dad and like their future husband and stuff that's why it's easy for girls to call you daddy and shit if they're really into you i think yeah because it's like but that's so weird it's like damn you reminded me me reminding you your pops turns you on like that's kind of wild like that's weird like i if i meet a girl that reminds me of my mom i instantly get like oh get the fuck away from me i'm not trying to hit that like i'm not even trying to think about none of that if you even look a little bit like my mom's I, that's no. actually the women you should want i think the only woman that treated you right well the thing yeah but here's the thing if they look like her if they act like her that's different but if they look like her i'm straight bro or like if they're too mommy like i hate girls that like they don't pay attention to your problem enough or they'll do it too much. Like, I'll post on Instagram. I'll be making a joke about, like, a restaurant not treating me right, maybe, or something like, they tied my bag up too tight at the restaurant, my my, my food bag. And she'll be like, oh, that's fucked up that they did that. I'm like, bitch, you're doing too much. All right? Clearly, I'm kind of joking here. I'm not, I don't really give a fuck about it. But then you'll talk to them about a serious situation. You'll tell them, like, something you're conflicted in your head about. And then they'll be like, oh, you just got to do that and you'll be fine. I'm like, bitch, you're not listening. You're not listening. So it's either you're doing too much, you're doing too little. Like, my future girlfriend or wife has to be right in the middle. Like, all right, you're talking too much. Here's what you should do, though. And I got your back if you need me. Like, mix it up a little bit. Don't fucking just be totally all in or totally backed off. That's why I haven't fallen in love with no girl because they don't know that balance. They don't know the, the middle ground. So... You know how your girl know you cheating and she don't tell you? No, nah, I don't cheat, but go ahead. If you did, the reason she knows you're cheating and you didn't cheat is because you're going to throw her pH levels off. <laughs> and that's why you can't be, you can't have sex with more than one woman at a time. Yes. Because you're going to throw her pH levels off. And she's going to know. She's going to tell you, I know something, but you're not telling me. But that's the reason she's saying that. That's the real reason, because she knows. Oh, so she knows not to invest in you because she knows you're fucking other girls. Oh, she going to know. I am fucking other girls, but she's not my girlfriend. That's the thing. But and she knows. Oh, so what you're saying is, at the end of the day, when a girl knows you're not completely invested in you, she's not going to be more willing to talk your problems out with you. Because she knows you're not really invested in her, so she's thinking, why the hell would I invest into your problems if you're not really invested in me? So this girl knows I'm seeing other women, therefore she's not going to invest in my conversations as much. If I was actually focused on her and wanted a future with you, she'd be more likely to talk to me about my problems. No, she's just waiting on you to stop lying to her. Man. Oh, stop lying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's just waiting uh, on you to yeah, stop yeah, lying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I she lied. knows you're lying. I'm you're like, just... I don't fuck nobody else but you, bitch. <laughs> oh, she knows. She knows. She just ain't told you. You know what? You're right. Because a woman will always tell me at the end, she's like, if you're just honest with me, everything goes away. But I'll be like, nah, there's no other bitches. Trust me. Like, I'll just, I, I can't. I'm not going to. Because I feel like if I tell you there's other bitches, then I don't, I've been breaking a lot of hearts lately, bro. I'm not going to lie. Like, my phone is filled with like four different women who are totally heartbroken by me. And I'm tired of it, bro, because I feel like I'm hurting somebody. It's not a good feeling when you hurt somebody. I learned to just talk to one woman at a time and fuck her Come a thousand on, different bro. ways. Come on, man. And, and say what? You fuck her friends? You know, you fuck her a thousand different ways. And if your girl wants you to have Come a threesome on. or something, she's going to bring the right girl to you. She's going to bring a clean girl. <laughs> and it's going to get busy. The girl's going to have like a background check done way before you get a word. Mm-hmm. So she, wait a minute. You're fucking one girl at a time? 
If you're serious about a girl? No, 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 no. Just period. I'm only fucking one girl. Oh, at a time. come on, man. I learned, what kind of horse shit is that? Well, she, you're you're famous. You can't be just settling with one woman at a time. Man. You, not settling if you dig it. Yeah. So you think, okay, what do you like more? Settling with one woman that meets your needs or maybe a hundred different badass bitches? Man. We know what happened when I was fucking with too many women. So <laughs> <laughs> I learned my lesson. Uh, one woman at a time and I got to trust you. Okay, but wait. If no other women have bothered you while you're with this one woman, well, is it? Would you rather be fucking a thousand bitches and not being bothered, or would you have one girl that you just have to focus on this one girl? Well, I'm gonna just say that when it happened, I learned my lesson <laughs> that you should just fuck with one woman. Nah, but that. before that, yeah, it's like, bro, it's like, who's gonna be stupid twice? <laughs> Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on you. I probably yeah. said that backwards, but you know what I'm saying. I get, I do. Okay, if you never got bit by a dog, do you like all the dogs out there? Like, uh, nah, I don't know, man. One woman. So, I, yeah, don't be posting all that crazy stuff on Instagram because your girl looking at it and you making her look stupid. Don't I make her look stupid. That's her only goal for you not to make her look I stupid. See, girl, I'll talk about a girl on a podcast. I won't say her name. I won't say where. I won't say nothing. I get a phone call right after. Why are you talking about me on the podcast? How the fuck did you know I was talking about you? And then I get interrogated, and I'm saying, no, it was never about you when it was. But I'm never going to admit that shit because I don't kiss and tell. But so, they know it. It's crazy. Like, women know when you're talking about them even when you don't fucking talk about who they are. That's why I'm going to stop even talking about women on this shit for real. I know the next time I'm on here, we need to listen to... Now that I'm one woman, man, <laughs> we need to listen to my crazy stories because I have so many crazy stories to tell. What do you got, tell. man? We're we, we talking about olds or now? Yeah, they all old. Everything's old. Everything's in the past, my past life. We, we, give me, throw it out there, man. Which one you want to? Which one could we just throw out there? Which I one you can think of on top of your head? You already talked to us about the time you uh, got drugged. Oh yeah, but no, I have <laughs> I, I, I've had better stories than that one. Like I've had wild nights. Like I've had foursomes and like mm, that ain't lit. What's lit? What's some of the lit stories? No, we're not gonna tell the one story, are we? Don't tell that one. Is he like the person that makes sure you don't say anything stupid or something? <laughs> oh no, this one time I fucked this girl that was shooting up. Oh, you told me about that. You talked about that. Yeah. Yeah, you talked about that. Then, or or what about the, um, oh, the throw up no, girl. No, you talked about that, man. The girl that came to give you a blowjob after the show and she had all those drinks. I was like, what? Well, but no, 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 but I met another girl <laughs> and she liked it. Uh, yeah, the one who was sucking your dick in the car. And she no, threw up all I met car? another girl and I knew not to stop because I didn't want to come. Oh. Uh. So I had another girl with throw up. What's, what's some more crazy shit? We, we didn't meet, ran into the girls with the fucking. With the beat up Air Force Ones, put them in a rap video. Fucking um, the girl that tied my shoe. Um, What's been the process like when we're creating this new CD with Skilla Baby? That was kind of lit because he let me like do what I want to do when when we're recording. Like most people be trying to make me be like too professional, make me like kind of like be uptight. But Skilla, he pull up, he be like, RJ, let me get you a bottle. He don't even drink. He's like, RJ, drink the bottle. Let's record. We sit there. But with Skilla, bro, we record 12 songs a day. Yeah. That sessions was intense. It's crazy that we record 12 songs. We did like 14 sessions, 12. That's like something like 150 songs. And six songs ended up on the CD. But <laughs> that's how much you can end up recording as an artist. Like you just get in that bag and you just be recording. Yeah. But yeah, I recorded all those songs on his new CD. Man, that's going to be brilliant. Uh to see this whole new wave that's coming up because I feel like it's crazy that you're you've worked in a you worked with the artists that you worked with at the caliber that they're at now like everybody's super successful that you've been working with but now this next wave that's coming up with Baby Tron and Skill it's like your hands are involved in that too so it's like you're following you're still a part of the you know the scene that you helped create and now you're a part of the next wave where some artists and producers are still caught up in the wave that they built and there's nothing further more than that. I mean, there's a new wave coming of music. We all have to see that it's it's happening right now, right? Yeah, because, like, right, and that's why even when I first started, I said, for 2023, I want to sound out. Because it's going to be another wave after this wave. Mm -hmm. So this next wave is what I'm really trying to focus on. So this wave, I kind of got locked down. We need mm -hmm. to focus on this next wave because it's, it's going to come quick and you're going to... You don't want to kind of be left behind. But it is crazy that, yeah, so when you could, when you could say, like, I said all the, I create Detroit music, but you think of like, okay, that's my old stuff, all the stuff I did back in the day. I'm still working with the top two artists in Detroit. It's like, okay. Yeah. Cool. Say what you want to say. I'm still working with the top artists. 
Um, are you still in work mode as far as the waking up in the morning, first thing on your mind, obviously your kid, and then getting straight to work? Or have you introduced anything new into your life? I'm trying to... That's what I'm saying, bro. Um, mm, no. I, I slack. I be slacking sometimes. I slack a lot. But I've been doing a lot of more engineering. So I've been engineering like four days a week. So with that, we those are like 24-hour sessions. So I'm staying up for like four days, three or four days, just recording. And then in the mix of that, I still got to get my kid from school and stuff. But that's really what I've been doing a lot, a lot more engineering. So I'm, I'm getting way better at engineering. So like now I'm like the fastest engineer you've ever seen. <laughs> now look at this. This is a Baby Tron concert, but you're on stage going crazy and everybody's going nuts to you. Uh, I recently did a show. Um, man, yeah. The RJ show is kind of like a lit show. It's... It's me, because it's like, I'm not trying to be nobody but myself. And myself is just happened to be the person that just make Detroit music. Like, the, like Detroit music is like me. It's like, it's, that's that's all I got. Like, that's me. So it's like, yeah, my shows are my shows are actually starting to get even more crazier. And it's like, we're working with some of these newer artists and streaming came out. It's like, it's, it's blowing up so big. Like, my song, What Up, RJ, is almost closing in on 4 million streams on iTunes. Whew. So I'm working on my new CD. My new CD about to come out. And that's what I'm saying. Like when I start the label, I'm gonna be the first artist that I put out as myself, and then I'm gonna put Rico Trap out second, and then we uh, gonna start signing artists. So, cause um, yeah, I know the process of like blowing up. Like as a rapper, like I don't know. I see people get mad at me, but I know the process. You can't get mad that I know the process. Someone told me the process, just like they told you the process, and I shared the knowledge. L that's just all it is. That's yeah. that's the only thing it is. So. Yeah, it's just stop. like another person in the game now. That's how people are probably looking at it. Like it's another person that knows how to do this, and now he's here. Yeah, the craziest thing is that nobody noticed me before I said that. I said that three months ago, and now people notice me. And it's like, what? I've been making music my whole life. I dedicated my whole life to making Detroit music. And yeah, you can say what you want to say, but nigga, I know what I did. Yeah. I was there. You was there too. Whoever says something, they, they saw me. They probably didn't notice me in the room because I was so quiet, but I was there too. You know what's funny? After you said that, I got like a few messages from like producers that have been in the game for a long time and they're like, that's not true because it was me basically. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and I just kind of sit in there like, damn. Like, But then I looked at their portfolio. I was like, Nah, bro. Like, I mean, if you're gonna say that RJ's portfolio is way stronger and has way more credibility, but, than it. but why we can't all say we was there? If yeah. You, if you was there, you was there when the when we was in sitting in the room, yeah. we was all there. But I know I was in the room. No cap. That picture too, man. It's more than one person on Mount Rushmore, bro. Yeah. It was a lot of people there. I seen everybody. I said I was standing on the other side of the room that they were standing on. Yeah, man. No, nah, but even crazy. Like, listen, you got to think. Like, when I first started being a promoter. Guess who the first artist I was booking for shows? When you first started promoting? Yeah, my first ever shows. Guess I thought Cash Kid. Hmm? Cash Kid? No, I'm talking about my first party. You know, I've been throwing parties oh, my party. whole life. Oh, party. I thought you were talking about the toys that you're doing now. No, I've been throwing parties my whole life. No, you know, no, You I know, know the first artist I started booking? No. Dope Boys? You, you, the first bro, artist? their first party, bro. I remember we booked them. They had the song called Our Dog Calls Out, and before that, they had Shake That Ass for a Rich Nigga, and they had, um, they had ringtones going crazy. And I was dating this girl that was a fan of them, like the craziest Doughboy fan ever. Yeah. And yeah, we was like, we should book them for a show. And we booked them for a show. Uh, it was a B. Jones show. B. Jones. And um, yeah, we booked them for a show. We booked them for their first show. I ain't gonna, nah, and I ain't going to even say we booked them for their first show. I just know that one of my first shows that I ever threw I booked Doughboys. So I was booking Doughboys. Were they, how hot were they at that time? Bro, when ringtones came out. <laughs> so people might not even know what a ringtone is. But we, <laughs> when we had cell phones, when ringtones came out, that was the only ringtone you would ever hear. What song was it? Shake that ass for a rich nigga in our dog hoes. Okay. But what's so crazy is that, like, so this is before social media. So everybody in Detroit... When you meet girls and stuff, you would tell them that you was one of the dope boys because no, no, no one really knew what they looked like yet. So every that's why everybody in Detroit is like like a dope boy. Like everybody be like, I was I used to say I was part of dope boys. I used to say because I, I know I know I said it a few times like yeah I'm, I'm in dope boys. Yeah. But no, they was on fire, and that's when because uh, mustard was doing their videos. He did scales in the kitchen, and um, 
Yeah, Mustard was doing their videos. Did you have a relationship with anybody in the Dobe's Cash Out group? All of them. And t- just talk about, expand on the relationships that you had with them. Oh, man, yeah. Like, you know, Fresh Fresh mm-hmm. was one of my, I was good, good friends with Fresh, R.I.P. Fresh. And then, you know, um, the DJ. Yeah, so, yeah, I was real cool with Fresh. That's who I was probably the coolest with. But, you know, I was, re- you know, my first time ever, like, really drinking liquor was, like, with Keese. And I remember one time I was in the studio with Keese. He brought a bottle and he, um, I poured a baby shot. Because, you know, like, when you're in the studio, you don't want to just, he looked at me and said, hey, bro, you don't like to get drunk? Mm-hmm. After that, I started drinking. Yeah. I was just in the studio with Clay like a week ago. Yeah. Uh, like a month ago, I was in the studio with HBK. And uh, I seen Payroll at the Baby Tron tour. You know, I talked to uh, Chaz all the time because Chaz booked the shows. And, you know, mm-hmm. I be still doing my promotion stuff, like booking artists. Everybody's trying to give them their flowers when they come on, people that have got to watch their legacy and watch what they built. And uh, if you, for a second, if you can reflect on what you've seen from them, just talk a little bit about the timeline and what you saw from them and how they got to the, the stats, status that they did now. Bro. <laughs> when Doughboys came out, bro, that was the <laughs> biggest shit since sliced bread. <laughs> <laughs> bro, it was like crazy. It was like, it was, because before that, to be a rapper, you had to be like an adult. They was the first like kids, like like rappers. So you know they had they had, but yeah, they had shit on Smash, and they was recording videos. Like people weren't recording rap videos yet. They was on fire. Doughboys was on fire. It was Scales in the Kitchen. That was the one. Scales in the Kitchen was like they had a music video to that. It was man. Yeah. But That's, you know, I know everybody else. Like, bro, even all the older people. Like, I, I, I was around them too. Mm. I used to be sit in the studio with them. They used to sit. They used to sit right like where you sitting and just be like, all right, look, when you get your shit started, this is what you got to do, RJ. You got to do it like this. You got to do it like that. So it's like, for, it's crazy how many people responded to me saying I created Detroit music. Like they didn't sit me down in a room and tell me how to do it. Like so many people sat me down and just showed me how to do it. Yeah. So it's like, and you happen to be the one that. You know, took the advice and moved with it and, and put it into motion. Yeah, I took all the advice. Yeah. They gave me the advice. They sat me down and gave it to me. Like, yeah. Ooh. It's interesting because even if I was an outsider and I looked at the situation or if I was affiliated with the scene and I seen what you had done from the beginning, I would at least say, like, in a respectful manner what I think you did. I didn't like how some OGs were calling you out and, like, kind of disrespecting you. Instead of saying, like, you helped for sure, if that was their perspective, like, because you definitely helped. Let's just say you weren't the first. I'm not saying you weren't, but let's just say you weren't. You are a huge contributing factor to it, right? So why not, if they're going to address you, say it in a way that's like, now look, bro, I respect the hell out of you. You did a lot. You did a lot. Like, you were a pivotal point in Detroit music. But I don't know if you can say you you created the scene. Instead of somebody messaging saying, like, my cousin's messed up right now. My cousin's tripping. Like, that's kind of where I was like, what's that all about? Like, you know what I'm saying? Okay, look. Think about when we had, when we first came on here, we said, I told you how I became a DJ and how I wanted to make a name for myself. Yes. Okay. So I'm DJing in the club playing certain artists' music, and they end up getting booked for shows at this club. Didn't they get booked for this club because I was sitting here playing their shit all night? Okay, so after I stopped DJing at those clubs, I started DJing at college campuses. The artists started coming to college campuses because I was playing all their music and I was bringing them out there. Okay, so now artists are getting booked at college campuses. Okay, I'm DJing at high schools and I'm playing all this Detroit music and now artists are getting booked at high school shows. Okay, I'm touring now and now I'm playing all this Detroit music and now artists are starting to get booked in other cities. Sometimes people just can't believe the idea that one person paved a way, right? Because it's like kind of hard to believe. Not, not I'm not taking a side on it or anything, but when I'm looking at it, it's like somebody did have to do it, right? And yeah. why? And and R. J. Lamont obviously has a huge portfolio. He's been here since the fucking beginning, essentially. Why? Are you dismissing him as the one who potentially was the one who did it? Why? Because are you- I'm not affiliated with nothing. I did it by myself. It's right. it's just RJ. RJ just living his own world. Like it's cause it's cause of that. It's like everyone wants to just look down upon me. Like I did something wrong when all I was trying to do was work. Yeah. I graduated college and I needed a way to work. I needed a way to make some money. Yeah. And just so happened, what I was trying to do made a lot of people rich. Right on. Uh, let's take two seconds real quick. I gotta check my phone. Let's see what the fuck's happening. Apparently my phone's blowing up. Let me see. Caller ID. Any fucking ways. All right, back on. He was the college promoter. 
<laughs> How did we get the Detroit rappers to the colleges? <laughs> Remember I told you when I was booking all the rappers in the colleges kind of the frats? Yeah. He's a Q. Okay. You know who the other one is? Nick Lavelle. You see the Detroit Michigan May tour coming up mm. with all the rappers? I haven't seen that yet. Where all the Michigan artists are going on tour to all the colleges? No, I haven't seen it yet. His oh, partner seen... did doing it. Okay, cool. So you guys are really you guys really uh caught a wave of people to put on on these on these uh college. Well, people want to see Detroit artists. Yeah. We all know this. People want to see the artists. The artists are the draw. We know this. Okay, but if I if I'm the DJ, how do I make my way in this? Well, I know the artists. I can bring out artists to y'all. Yeah. That's the thing. When you have these relationships too, you have more accessibility to the people who you've helped build, and they 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 have a good relationship to the point where they'll work with you, and they feel very comfortable working with you. I think that's kind of why people fuck with me to some degree. Where like I'm able to reach out to an artist and tell them to, you know, hop on the podcast because I genuinely built a relationship with a lot of people. So in two years, when a lot of them pop off. Even for you, if you get to the biggest scale in the world, you're my friend at the end of the day. I'm going to be able to say, RJ, pull up, right? Yeah. So you built that relationship with people on a genuine level versus just some random promoter that's calling you and saying, hey, I got a bag for you. Well, but also, you got to think about my, my point of view. Like I told you, I was just trying to make some money. So let's, let's say I wanted to DJ in Dallas, Texas tomorrow. Mm -hmm. How can I, as RJ Lamont, go to Dallas, Texas and DJ? Well, I know Baby Tron, and I know Skiller Baby, and all these people. I know y'all trying to book them anyway. Mm. Why don't you book me to DJ, too? <laughs> yeah, right, right. That's why we're so lucky that Detroit's blowing up, because it, it's really putting that portfolio together. Does that need to cool down? Yeah, it's starting to get... I don't know what it is, man. It's getting tonight. It just keeps getting really... We'll give it a couple minutes. No problem. Yeah. I'm ready. Okay, okay, yeah. we're rolling. When I was saying, when I was saying that, what what I forgot to say with even the RJ story is that like the person who created the song "East Side Niggas Fucking West Side Bitches" is Maserati Money. Like I didn't say his name in the interview when I was saying like the song that broke with Team Eastside. That was one thing I forgot was RFK Mazi. He made the song. PZ and Ray was featured on the song, and that is the first Detroit song that popped. But the hook did come from a Babyface Ray song. The first Team Eastside song that really got recorded was "East Side Where the Real Money At." And like the first line of the song is East Side niggas fucking West Side bitches. I got it all on me on the West Side with it. Well, they turned that into a hook, and that was the other song, the other song that got created. But that was Maserati Money song. But yeah, I remember when I said that when I did do that interview and I said that I did see a lot of people saying that, saying about that like that was Mazi's song. Mazi, Mazi, my brother for life too. That's a uh, landslide. Calico in them. Oh, okay. That's Calico, where the RJ good. always tripping came from. That's how I know Calico. Mm, okay. So basically. That's that's a far back, man. Like you're talking about far, far back, right? So, yeah. Like I said before, we got on here, man. It's like people don't ever want to say who helped create something or started something. I'm not saying you did, because I don't know. I wasn't fucking there to see what the hell you were doing or accomplishing. But at the same time, I just I wish people would look at it from two perspectives. Like if you helped, then give that respect for helping, and then say what you want to say after that. Don't totally just dismiss that somebody wasn't a part of something. If you brought Tone Tone in here right now, his comment was obviously like kind of shaming you to some degree or saying like you're tripping basically but it's like if i brought toe tone in here like how much do you think he did help though on a scale of one to ten how much do you think rj helped pivot detroit music and bring the sound to it bring sound to the scene he would have to say a, a substantial number he wouldn't be like zero one two three no he'd probably say like eight nine like you contributed a lot to making the scene what it is today but those are still artists it's like yeah with artists like saying that it's like bro Y'all are the artists. It's like they don't know exactly what's going on. It's like I'm still the producer. Like, mm -hmm. what producer did it then? That's I a good mean, point. Or what DJ did it? That's a so good point. I remember if you wanted to like get your music played from a Detroit DJ, you have to go to the club and buy him a drink and give him some money. And he's gonna play your song <laughs> at ten thirty while ain't nobody there. <laughs> so that was like a DJ hustle for a long time. Well. Yeah, I started playing music at 12. Mm. So when I started playing music at 12, records started breaking. People was actually there to hear the song. DJs don't break new music. Now, at the end of the day, these are all artists having opinions on what I said, but what DJ did it then? Yeah. If I didn't do it, what DJ did it? So when you go to the club, all you hear is Detroit music. And when I came on here, I said, I made a name for myself by only playing Detroit music. So, yeah, those are still artists. Like It's like... 
I get it. I get it. I respect all these legends and stuff. But you got to think I was a DJ and I was listening to y'all legendary music. And I was like, bro, these are my favorite songs. Mm. So when I go DJ, I'm going to play this. I'm not going to play the top 10 songs on the radio. So right. you can't really discredit me because I did do that. I did go to the club and I did play y'all songs. And I did DJ every big party and I played y'all songs. Yeah. Yeah. I was I'm, the radio. And then you had to think I was doing mixtapes. Bro, when I would get, get done with clubs, I would put the top Detroit songs on a mixtape with the top songs in the country and I would call it like a hype ass mixtape and I would put all my drops so like when you were saying like all the producers getting DJ drops my DJ drops come from me being my mixed I mean my producer drops come from me being a DJ because I would drop my tag on every song RJ Lamont ooh RJ RJ always tripping before every song started because I knew most people only had one CD in their car and that one CD probably had all the good songs so after the club I would pass them out I would pass them out I would pass all my CDs and yeah you flooded it. You just, I flooded it. Yeah, it's like I was flood. I, I seen what rappers was doing because I was around rappers and I was seeing what they was doing. I was like, how do I how do I apply this to being a DJ? How do you feel about rappers kind of doing subcategory types of entertainment right now? Because, for instance, you probably wouldn't see a Doughboy cash out like reviewing music or starting a podcast, right? Like you probably wouldn't see them. Oh, I mean, I guess nowadays they pro- they possibly would just because they've already done everything right and they're probably chilling out but let's say you have a a rapper that's like popping off right now how do you feel about them doing subcategory stuff like music reviews or podcasting or doing anything except for rap i think it's weird i do too i think it's weird it's like bro you, you it's like dry snitching what you mean? It's like, it's like why, why are you telling people business all day? Like, be a rapper. Go make songs. Like, they mm. forgetting that the the reason that these fans even like you is because you make music. Stop, mm. Just make music. Like, I get it. But you like you can either create content, but no, I think it's weird. You shouldn't you shouldn't be doing that. Like, I had a I had a homeboy a homeboy rapper that uh made a whole podcast about me when I had my little situation. I'm like, bro, this is weird. Mm. This is weird. I don't mm. like it. Right. Let, like, let the, let the journalism stick to the journalism. That ain't what you want to do. Yeah. I'll, I only I only agree with it when it comes to rappers because I feel like the mystique of a rapper is already getting so freaking limited. Like remember what Dr. Dre said? Dr. Dre said like artists are killing their mystique because they're always in the public eye right now. You can see them on every social media app doing everything from making breakfast to what club they're going to tonight. So you're killing the mystique. So when an artist starts doing music reviews or starts their own podcast, it's like, bro, I'm hearing you all the time. And you're doing stuff that kind of exposes who you are in too many different dimensions for me to fuck with your music as much. So I'm wondering, for from a fan's perspective, is a fan still fucking with a rapper that's doing music reviews or has his own podcast or is just making skits on Instagram or TikTok and stuff like that? Am I looking? Am I listening to his music the same way? Are you losing me as a fan of your music in order for me to become a? you know, a profit scheme now. Now I'm paying you to review my music or I'm watching you make some sk- silly skit. You That's because your saying? music suck and you thought you was bigger than a producer that was producing you. <laughs> so you got to figure something else out. Yeah. So you so you don't like it. You don't like artists dabbling in too many different categories. I'm saying if you were sticking with your producer, you wouldn't have to do that because your music wouldn't suck. Yeah. And you wouldn't have time to do that because you're too busy doing rapper stuff. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I get it. Yeah, yeah. People got to find ways to make their money. I feel like if you don't believe in yourself enough, that's when you start doing subcategory stuff for real. Like, if you no, don't believe in yourself. I just said it. It's because you didn't believe in your producer yeah. and your music sucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah right on. <laughs> um, what's, been, what's been on your mind lately just in life, man? Like, uh, you don't take a break from thinking about music? Do you ever just, like, clear out your mind and just... Uh, bro, that's too much money out here to be playing around and not thinking about that. I ain't gonna lie. Shit. Once I realized that, it was like, oh, shit. Yeah. It's too much money going around out here. It's you don't like, want to miss the opportunity, right? Like, especially if you're in the game, to take a break or to stop and stare at it, you can't, right? Yeah, because when you're staring at it, somebody else working. Somebody down here is trying to get here. I know. I always think about the next big podcast that's going to blow up, like, come in Detroit, and it's like, oh, it's like it pops so much. They'd be like, fuck kiddos podcast. And like, all right, so I got to keep producing this shit. No, no, no. Only real shit is gonna be around forever. The rest of that shit gonna be here today <laughs> and gone tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell these days an artist that's gonna have longevity versus the one that's a one hit kind of popped off now, kind of fade out later thing? Yeah, um, Do you have like a sense for it? N- not really, because everybody is one hit away. Like even somebody that had a one hit wonder, if they made a, another good song, 
Not really, but yeah, some people only got one good song in them. Okay, all right, give me two seconds. I mean, <laughs> we'll have you back on again, man. It's no, you already know your honorary guest to have you on just consistently. But nah, I always want to come on the Kid L podcast because, and then like, it's like, this is like the podcast where everybody be the first or something. And it's crazy that I ended up in that same moment. I was like, oh my God. Yeah. I'm not trying to be the first, like, on the Kid L podcast. But, but one it's day always we're going to look back it. at this shit like, you know, it's going to be funny to us, but it's also going to be historic at the same time because there's a lot of truth being told. You know, I don't think, I think when topics get blown up like that, I think it's because there's truth involved to it. There's some people who don't want their egos get in the way of it. And then there's some people who truly do know the truth. And that's why posts go crazy. Because if it was just pure facts, like people, who, who gives a fuck? Right. If it's pure facts for everybody, it's like, who gives a fuck? But if it's like some people disagree because they felt like they did it or somebody else did it, then that's when the controversy starts. But then there's also people who know it's true. So that's why more comments get in the mix of it. But when I saw it, there was a lot of people in your defense. I feel like uh, at the end of the era, though, as far as, like, I said this to Cash or Kwan. I think we didn't know how big our reach would be, like my podcast. No, I'm not trying to toot my own horn or anything. But I don't think we knew how big, like, our reach was. So sometimes we just say stuff without being exact. And, like... That's why people are trying to be more exact when they come on now, because like 100,000, 200,000 people might see this clip now. And now we got to be more precise about what we say versus if you went on Adam 22, we'd phrase stuff a little bit differently because you already know 4 million people are going to see this shit. Yeah, and that's what's uh, why I like doing podcasts, because it gives me the opportunity to speak my voice, because it's like, before I start coming on your podcast, nobody, I, I, I still been doing the same thing. I've been doing the same thing every day for 20 years down there. And it's like, no one really paid attention. They, they knew what I was doing. Everybody know what I'm doing is special. Everybody know that I'm not signed to nobody. So what, and you can't sign me because I know all the information of, <laughs> of how y'all fucking everybody over. <laughs> like I know the industry because I was there in the yeah. beginning. So that's, so with that being said, it's like, yeah, once I came in this podcast and I said something, it's like, all my friends, that's like the higher ups that's actually running the industry right now, they're all laughing at me about it. And they joke with me and they be like, ah, look at the guy out there in Detroit. Look at him. Mm. Ah, it's funny. But at the end of the day, we know that if you meet me, I can change your life. Listen, let's, let's not excuse that fact. If you meet me, I can change your life. Facts, bro, facts. You and that, that's always going to be a fact. Whether I created it or not, if you meet me, I can change your life. Facts. Bro, when I met you for the first time, it was actually a pivoting point for me. Even though I just came to take photos for you, it like, man, I remember because it was like, I took the photos and then everybody's like, oh, you worked with RJ, you worked with RJ. And at the time, your name was super, super, super hot too. But then you just like kept a connection with me and you taught me game and I learned a lot from you, bro. And having you on these podcasts is nothing but, you know, it's fun as fuck yeah. and in this, this game. Um, they say I'm like a squirrel. <laughs> they say like I ain't got nothing. I'm just, I'm not, I ain't got nothing in my head. I'm just always moving, always doing uh, yeah, something, always, always doing weird. something. Um, listen, man, it's been awesome having you on again, bro. Look forward to this uh, these shows that you got coming up. Um, and obviously, you come back. But I think every couple months is a good Oh, uh, you should mark. do Rico Trap. When I bring Rico Trap, you should do him. All right, bring him on. Bring him on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rico Trap, bring him I got a, We got a show January 7th. And then um, I got my next showcase December 30th. Where we're looking for the next big artist of 2023. Right. Because 2023, we signing the artist. So yeah. the, the, you, you getting the RJ stimulus package. If you want to yeah. blow up, come through my label. And I, I, I just got a new label deal. So with my new deal, I just got a label deal. So, yeah. Basically, I tapped in with a label and I told them that I didn't want to be a worker no more. And they gave me my own label. Fire. Boom. I'm just excited. ask. If you close miles, don't get fed. 2023 that, is the Jordan year. So yeah. we're gonna be taking off, man. Um, Why are you going to Air Jordan? Facts. Get the fuck. Uh, I, yeah. I almost came on here and set crisscross applesauce, but I I practiced it at home and I couldn't do it. Yeah, it's all right. People are trying, man. They're not lasting more than fifteen seconds. I have to set up a challenge for it. Uh, listen, we had R.J. Lamont in the building. We're shooting at Parallel Sound Studio. High Low Visuals is shooting these productions. 